Yo, what's up guys? Welcome to Digital Arts USMLE. So we're going to start off by covering some microbiology. And we're just going to start with Staph aureus, just because it's pretty simple. So we're going to cover its characteristics, the virulence factors, the organ systems affected by it, and the treatment options based on the type of infection. And while we're at it, we can cover some of the mechanisms of action or some of the antibiotics we can use against it. So what exactly is Staph aureus? Well, it's a gram-positive facultative anaerobe that is a staphylococci organism. Staphylococci means that it just forms grape-like clusters. Facultative anaerobe just means that it can survive in both aerobic or anaerobic environments. And the gram-positive part just means that once the organism is fixed to a slide, aka dead, we go through a four-step process. The first is adding a crystal violet dye, which will go through the bilayer and enter inside the cell. We can then add iodine afterwards, which crystallizes the dye, so it's too big to even leave the cell now. And then alcohol is added to destroy the lipid bilayer for both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. But because gram-negatives have a thin peptidoglycan layer, which is now damaged, the stains can easily move in and out. So for gram-negative organisms, we have that extra fourth step, which is just adding safranin and that's just a counter stain and it allows us to see those non-colored cells so that's really all it is um so just going back to staph aureus it's part of our normal flora it's pretty much located everywhere on our surface from our skin to our nose and just a little bit more about it it does produce acid from mannitol and mannitol salt agar and it is beta hemolytic so all that means is that it produces hemolysin so it can just lyse the blood and pretty much suck up all the nutrients from it. So the first thing we want to do is distinguish staph from strep. That's really the big thing. So there's just one test that distinguishes the two, and that's the catalase test. Um, staph is usually catalase positive. The catalase just breaks down the hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, and this just helps us distinguish the two. And then once we have those things distinguished, then we can go further down, and we can distinguish staph aureus from Staph epidermidis and Saprophyticus by using the coagulase test. So Staph is coagulase positive. The coagulase messes around with prothrombin, aka factor 2, on the coagulation cascade, and eventually it activates it. So then it'll go down the line and it'll start to activate factor 1, which is fibrinogen, and then it'll activate fiber. And once it has this fibrin, it pretty much wraps itself around it like a blanket. And the fibrin just protects it from phagocytosis. So it is one of the virulence factors. And if you want to go into real, real detail on it, there's actually two types of coagulase. There's just bound coagulase and free coagulase. The only difference is that bound coagulase is literally bound to the cell wall. And it allows it to clump up, whereas free coagulase is just shoots out everywhere. So some of the other virulence factors are the clumping factor, aka the fibrinogen binding protein. And all it does is just it binds to fibrinogen on the normal endothelial surface. We also have coagulase, which is what we just went over, converts fibrinogen to fibrin, coats itself, and pretty much resists phagocytosis. Plus it causes vegetation, which is pretty bad, and it can slow down white blood cells. Another one is alpha toxin which just forms pores inside the cells. And since it's forming pores inside the cells, all its crap is gonna leak out. And yeah, the cells pretty much gonna die. And it does that to like red blood cells, like platelets, heart cells, a whole bunch of cells. And then there also has a thromboplastin, which you can build, and that helps in making the vegetations. And it has tychoic acid, which is the last one, which binds onto the fibronectin of damaged cells and clots. Oh yeah, and I forgot protein A, which basically binds to the FC portion of IgG and prevents phagocytosis. So it affects a whole bunch of organ systems and organs, such as the dermis, so it can cause cellulitis, it can cause abscesses, scalded skin syndrome, impetigo, mastitis, it can affect the cardiovascular system, it can cause like toxic shock syndrome and acute endocarditis. And when I say acute, I mean specifically acute. So don't get it confused with subacute endocarditis, which is in staph epidermidis, which is different. It can also affect the GI system with its toxic-mediated foodborne illness, 
it affects the prostate, such as in prostatitis. So it also causes typical pneumonia as well. Um, it's not that high of a cause, uh, but it can cause it. And it does affect the bones and joints. It can cause pyogenic osteomyelitis. And it's also the second most common cause of infectious arthritis in older kids and adults. So starting with the dermis, you have cellulitis, which pretty much just affects the dermis layer and the subcutaneous fat. The area affected is usually going to be pretty red, warm, and most of the time pretty painful. Unless, of course, they're diabetic, then they may not feel any pain now there, or they may not feel too much pain since of their neuropathy. So I just want to give you that heads up. But just remember that this does require a portal of entry, meaning that you need a break in the skin. So some of the complications are thrombophlebitis, lymphangitis, and abscesses. And in the case of dental procedures, you have to worry about Ludwig's angina. And that's just a big fancy name for cellulitis in the submandibular space. So if they are infected and it's with MRSA, you're going to have to use something called vancomycin, IV, or linazolid, which can be given either IV or PO. So vancomycin, it just works by capping the end of d ala d ala to prevent cross-linking and it stabilizes and stabilization between the peptidoglycan layer and the NAMNAC. This pretty much messes up the structure of the whole cell wall and if it's resistant to vanc, then that usually means that that d ala d ala has now been changed to something else like d ala d lactate so at this point you're pretty much screwed. So the next thing we have is linazolid. The mechanism of action hasn't been described too well on this, but it pretty much messes up the protein synthesis initiation step. So it screws around with the 30S, the 50S ribosomes, the tRNA, the mRNA, and yeah, it just screws up the whole complex. So also for a community acquired MRSA, we can use something called clindamycin or TMP SMX can also be used. So staphylococcus can also cause scalded skin syndrome, which usually affects kids or babies. The bacteria produces something called an exfoliative toxin, specifically exfoliative toxins A and B, which separate the stratum granulosum from the rest of the skin. So it looks like their skin is completely burned and it's blistering and it looks all like disgusting and gross. Yeah. It can affect the mucosa as well, so you have to watch out. So while you're doing your physical exam, just make sure you check out their mouth and nose. They do require IV antibiotics, antipyretics, and they require IV fluids as well because they're going to present like burn patients. So you just want to make sure that they don't get dehydrated. Mastitis is another complication that can be caused, and it's just inflammation of the breast, and it's usually from injury of the nipple, and it just causes an infection around that site. Um, so the breast is going to have like localized tenderness, and the nipple may look cracked because you know the baby's sucking on it and gonna bite it and all that crap. So yeah. So remember, the mother can still continue to breastfeed on the affected breast. Yes. She can still continue to breastfeed. It's still safe for the infant. So I'm just telling you guys like heads up right now. So just tell mom besides that, you know, if she's still having pain, just tell her to milk herself like every six hours and this will help with the duration and the improvement of the symptoms. So yeah, but if the symptoms do get worse, like they continue after day one or you tell her to, you know, continue doing all this milking of herself and she's still having problems then you could probably do like a milk culture which I've never seen done but apparently in the books it says you can do it and you can find the organism growing and uh, you can give antibiotics like diclocloxacillin or cephalexin so yeah and if it's yeast mastitis then that's painful as hell and you'll know because the mom will be extremely painful and you want to give fluconazole for that. That can also cause impetigo. So that just causes erythematous papules in bullus impetigo around the mouth area and the face. 
it's usually pretty itchy it's in kids and it just requires an oral antibiotic it can also cause acute endocarditis like how we said earlier it can affect the cardiovascular system if you have acute endocarditis it can cause high fevers it can cause systemic toxicity it will definitely damage the heart valves you're usually going to find it in IV drug users because remember how we said earlier that is part of our normal flora it's on our skin if you're poking yourself and you're constantly injecting these needles into your skin and you're bound to push some of that stuff into your blood system. You're gonna have the IV drug users, they're gonna get affected by it, and yeah, it's gonna affect the undamaged heart valves as well. Just remember, it can affect the damaged and undamaged heart valves. And it can also bind to fibrinogen on the surface of the heart and fibronectin, which is not only on the surface of the heart, but uh, it's like another place as well. So it usually affects the tricuspid valve first, because that's where blood enters from, you know? So it's like the first valve it goes through right when it goes through the heart, the tricuspid valve. I'm not saying it can't affect other places, but the tricuspid is gonna be high yield on the exam. So if you hear like a murmur or something around that area, then yeah, you might want to suspect it. So another thing it can cause is toxic shock syndrome. It can occur from contraceptive sponges, tampons, nasal packing, nosebleeds uh, that have stayed in for just like way, way too long. Uh, it's specifically from toxic shock syndrome, toxin 1, which is secreted by the bacteria. And it's dangerous because it acts as something called a super antigen. So all that means is that it crosslinks the MHC2 receptor from the antigen presenting cell to the T cell receptor on the CD4 cell, aka the T helper cell. And then right after it crosslinks it, it can pop out of the T cell receptor and then crosslink additional MHC2 receptors to T cell receptors. Eventually, it causes a whole bunch of T cells to become activated, and they're going to be releasing all these inflammatory cytokines, and that's going to cause this cytokine storm. So, even a few antigens can cause a serious amount of damage, so you don't need a lot. And just for those that want additional information, the CDC has some pretty strict criteria on the diagnosis of toxic shock syndrome. The first is that the temperature has to be elevated above 102. You're going to need a systemic blood pressure of less than 90 because, of course, they're in shock. You're going to present with a diffuse macular erythematous rash. They're going to have desquamation of the palms and soles. That's usually going to be a little bit later, like after one to two weeks. And then they'll also have the involvement of three or more organ systems. So you just got to be careful of that. And usually the blood, throat, and CFOS cultures will be negative for other types of bacteria besides Staph aureus. You also have to test them for rickettsia, leptospirosis, and measles. So if all six criteria are met, then you know they have toxic shock syndrome. So besides that, they can affect the GI system like we said earlier. They form these preformed toxins. They're called enterotoxins since they affect the gut. And one of those toxins is called SEA, which is pretty damn stable. And it can pass through the acidic environments in the stomach. And it can also function as a super antigen. So one of the big problems with this is that they bind to the neural receptors in the upper GI. They can actually stimulate the vomiting center in the brain because they, they transmit impulses through the vagus nerve and the sympathetic nerves, which end up stimulating the vomiting center in the area of postrema. So, well, yeah, you're gonna end up vomiting. And because it uses enterotoxins, there is no such tissue invasion that there is like, required. They can just pretty much rape you from the outside. So yeah, and it also shifts the balance of water and electrolytes, causing watery diarrhea. Usually you won't see any white blood cells in the feces, um, so it's considered a non-inflammatory like diarrhea. And it usually starts within a few hours of eating. So like you eat something like, I don't know, like mayonnaise or eggs that's just been like sitting out for too long or you have something from some unclean food handler and you start getting like water and diarrhea then yeah I want to it. so besides that you usually don't have to worry about fevers or chills and it has a pretty short incubation time up to like eight hours so another thing can cause is prostitis which is pretty rare for this organism and exam wise you probably aren't going to see too much from this organism as it's usually age dependent for prostatitis. Prostatitis, I can't even pronounce it right. So if they're less than 35, you want to think of Midia trachomonitis or Neisseria gonorrhea. And if they're older than 35, then you might want to think of like E. coli or Pseudomonas aeruginosa 
or Klebsiella pneumonia, but mainly E. coli. That's like the main thing. Yeah, and usually if they're less than 35, just think of like the serious gonorrhea. So that's just like the takeaway message for that. And just on physical exam and on presentation, they'll usually present with fevers and chills because it's around the prostate area. You know, they're gonna have lower back pain. They're gonna have urinary infrequency because I don't know the prostate is swollen as hell. So it's gonna be hard for piss to be moving through the urethra. And uh, yeah, once you do a digital rectal exam on them and you're feeling for the prostate, they're gonna have a lot of tenderness around that area. So besides this, it can also cause osteomyelitis and affects the bones and the joints. Osteomyelitis is just an infection of the bone. It's pretty common in children. In radiographs, you can see periosteal elevation and a lytic center with a sclerotic border. So I'll just show you guys like a few pictures of it, how it looks like. So just remember MRI is considered the gold standard for it. But if symptoms are obvious, then there's really no need to do MRI. I mean, you can just go straight to like the treatment. Uh, so yeah, I just want to make that like obvious out there. So if it's penicillin sensitive, then you want to use nafcillin, which is a pretty good choice. Otherwise, just stick with bank. So it can also cause infective arthritis. And that just presents with pain and warmth and tenderness. And yeah, it's just going to be like redness, I hear edema around the joint. And it's usually from staph, it'll spread systemically. So if the patient is septic, then you'll have to watch out because when you see like these symptoms, then you're going to have to do like a joint fluid aspirate and draw out some of that fluid. And then you're going to like take it to the lab and be like, yo guys, test it for like white blood cells, like do your gram stain and your culture and like your glucose and your crystal analysis, you know? So yeah, you just want to start them on IV empiric antibiotics and you want to treat it like ASAP while you're waiting for the sensitivities. So lastly, it can cause a typical pneumonia and it can cause consolidation. So consolidation is just like pus that's caused from like the active recruitment of neutrophils. So there are special chemoattractants that come from like these bacterial capsules or glycoproteins that they have. And one of them is called like LTB4. It's like a whole list of them, but I think like LTB4 is probably the most high yield. And these pretty much activate the neutrophils. And then there's like all this release of like IL-6 and IL-8 and IL-1 which recruits like the macrophages. And this process just allows the cells to enter into the target tissue as well. So it's that whole process of diapodesis. And in this case, these cells are gonna be entering into the alveoli space. So once they enter that area, they pretty much like rape the bacteria with like a variety of mechanisms that they have. So that's just like found in the innate immune system, such as like complemented mediated lysis, which includes the binding of complement to bacteria to enhance oxidization with like your C2B. So you get those macrophages and they just like chomp on the bacteria. And then you have your MAC complex, like C5 to C9. They just like form the holes. And yeah, they pretty much like rape bacteria as well. In the end, all that's gonna happen is really pus is gonna be formed with all the cells there. And you're gonna cough out sputum. And you'll usually hear crackles and they may have fever. An x-ray may show like a low bar pneumonia or interstitial pneumonia. They can present all differently. Oh yeah, and just a toss of one zebra that you have to worry about since it is a catalase positive organism. It's an organism you need to worry about in patients who have chronic granulomatous disease. So normally we have two ways to get rid of organisms after phagocytosis. So once a, your white blood cell chomps down on the bacteria, it pretty much has its own digestive pathway as well. So it has these two processes. And the first one is an NADPH oxidase which pretty much reduces oxygen into superoxide anion, a hydroxyl radical, and a hydrogen peroxide molecule as well. And these are pretty much all, well, they pretty much all just like rape the microbes. So besides that, we also have myeloperoxidase, which uses that hydrogen peroxide for the previous step, and it basically converts it into hypochlorite, which is pretty much bleed. So either way, it doesn't have to be from that step. There's like a whole bunch of reactions in our body that make this hydrogen peroxide 
and this hydrogen peroxide has to get eliminated from our body as well because it's just in general cytotoxic to our own cells and the bacterial cells. So the problem is, is that in chronic granulomatous disease, there is basically no superoxide anion available. So basically the problem in chronic granulomatous disease is that you're missing your NADPH oxidase. And since you're missing your NADPH oxidase, you're not going to get any of those like superoxide anions or hydroxyl radicals being formed. And you'll still get the hydrogen peroxide from the other enzymatic reactions in the body. But now you have like this bacteria, it has catalase, and it's so it's converting all of that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So it's pretty much completely useless, and now you have nothing to fight off these bacteria, so you're pretty much screwed against the catalyzed positive organisms like Staph aureus. So these people usually get these recurrent bacterial infections, and since it's expressed as an X-linked recessive disease, you're going to have to worry about this in rooms. So that is pretty much Staph aureus in a nutshell. And if you like it, please subscribe. I'm making new videos every day. And if you have any recommendations or anything you'd like to see more of, just let me know. All right, later guys.